Uh, Let's open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. We are doing a series for about six or eight different studies on, on the church. What is the church? What is this thing called church? What is the purpose of the church, the calling of the church, the design of the church? There's a lot of ideas in the world, both um, you know, religious, secular, philosophical, emotional. Some people have been hurt by what is called church. Uh, others love what is called church. All kinds of varied opinions and ideas and experiences. We always want to go back to the, to the origin. We always want to go back to the source, uh, to the Bible. What does God say about what the church is? And so my, my goal in these teachings, in these studies that we're going to be doing is to, to maybe examine some of the prevailing ideas about what church is and what people think it should be and then compare it to what the Bible says and say, where does it match up? Where does it not match up? And then to see what God says about the church, and then for us to be encouraged to live that out. And so we are in Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. Um, and then we'll have a word of prayer, then we'll dive in. Uh, Paul is writing from prison in Rome. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to have a walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So, let's pray together. Lord, you love your church, and, and Jesus said, you said that you would build your church. And that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. The gates of hell wouldn't overcome your church. And, and we see a lot of things that, that uh, concern us, that are called church, etc., Lord, but we want to know your heart. And so uh, here we are, gathered as a church. What does it mean, Lord? Teach us, God. Teach us to appreciate your church, to love your church, to protect your church, and to understand your church, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We commit this to you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to start. You have notes there. We're going to start with some non-biblical thoughts regarding what I'm calling the United Church. Uh, that's the title of the message, the United Church, a church in unity. There are concepts of the United Church, or there's another word that people use called the ecumenical church, and there are a lot of people around that think... Um, you know, we should just all hold hands with everybody. If, it, if you're a person of, of faith, quote-unquote, uh, it really doesn't matter what you believe. It just matters that you believe. And I, I've always found that kind of phrase a bit interesting. It doesn't matter what you believe. It just matters that you believe. Uh, but it does matter what we believe. But there are those who think, you know, we should throw anything that would cause us to differentiate with one another. We should get rid of doctrines and dogmas and those kinds of things and just come together emotionally and you know I get a little I'm going to be a little facetious this morning and hold hands and sing kumbaya and you know we are the world we are the children and drink coke and and support the olympics you know and 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 that kind of thing I I, a little bit of tongue-in-cheek but you guys know what I mean there's a sentiment in the world that says why can't we just all get along why do we need different churches why are there different churches there are people that see that the fact that there are different churches as a failure, and uh, so I'm not going to be a part of any church, that kind of thing. So this idea of the ecumenical church, let me just kind of read my notes here, a little bit uh, dictionary-ish. It means to, general or universal. That's the idea, that there should be a church that is general or universal. Uh, or, of or, it's either of the Christian church or, or the Christian church is part of it. It's the furthering of the unity or unification of Christian and non-Christian churches. So some people, again, once they believe that, you know, we don't want to have division with, with people. And, you know, I'm not one who, who embraces division or, or thinking that we're better than anyone else. I'm not one who embraces that kind of thing. But to some, the idea of ecumenicalism is, the, is that all faiths ought to be united. And there shouldn't be any distinction at all. There should just be, you know, one building in each town uh, called church, and, and if you're a person of faith, you should go there. Some are even suggesting, and you can read these things online, that uh, Islam, Christianity, Judaism should, should unite and, um, you know, come together as one movement. It's an interfaith approach. Others narrow down the idea of ecumenicalism and speak of the need to unify the Christian church. They call it evangelical ecu, ecu big word for me, ecumenicalism. There, I got it. 
Here's a, here's a quote uh, from a webpage called religioustolerance.org. So this is, this is just some of the thoughts that are out there. You can backtrack these things. It says this, the current status of Christianity is one of great disunity. There are on the order of 1,500 Christian organizations in North America alone. Each follows a unique blend of beliefs and practices. Many believe that they, now this is the problem, many believe that they and they alone represent the true church. So there certainly is a mindset of, uh, you know, we're better than you kind of thing and we're the true church and uh, there are even some uh, churches that, are, that go by the name of Christian church that say unless you're baptized in a certain way with certain words, you're not a Christian. And even they go so far as saying if you don't go to our church, all the other churches are reprobate and they're heretical and uh, they're not real churches, only our church is real and that kind of thing. I don't buy that at all. I think the body of Christ, the church of Jesus is expressed in, in many flavors, uh, many nuances, many distinctions. I'm not gonna call them differences, I'm gonna call them distinctions. And the body of Christ is a lot bigger than us or the church down the street or whatever. Uh, but we come together around the person of Jesus Christ. We, get, we gather together around him. In fact, if you're kind of new to the church, just to let you know, something that happens uh, on Good Friday, the Friday before Easter, for the last seven or eight years, uh, we started gathering together with, with Hillside Christian uh, Church uh, of seven or eight years ago, don't remember exactly, and we met here, and the first one uh, was just us and them, and then we expanded it, and it was about four churches gathering together every Good Friday, uh, different worship teams. Uh, we rotated the guy that was gonna preach. We rotated the guys that were facilitating communion. Last year, here in this room, we had seven churches, and, and it was bilingual service. And it was, how many of you were here for that? It was, it was a great time. It was a really great time. Bilingual worship, bilingual preaching, the whole thing. It's tremendous. So seven churches with distinctions that, that give them enough reason to be independent entities and yet around the person of Jesus coming together. And so uh, some people just think we shouldn't have any distinctions and there should just be an ecumenical church and any distinctions uh, will lead to differences and differences lead to separation and separation is always bad and so that's the idea behind that so one little quote here uh, down under the need for agreement to summarize the problem with the church in some people's view is that the church is not unified and we need to decide to put our disagreements aside be unified for the sake of god and for the sake of people but this is a non-biblical conclusion it's an emotional conclusion uh, it's a, it's a well-intentioned con uh, conclusion by many people. We can't judge your intentions. Um, it's pragmatic. I'll use some words. It's earthly. It's natural. It's not spiritual. It's okay to have distinctions, in my opinion, and distinctions among churches don't create disunity. They're just distinctions. And so we're going to continue to look at that. So what is the biblical view of the United Church? It's a biblical fact that disagreements have always existed in the church ever since it began. We're going to backtrack some of those things. The fact that Paul exhorts the Ephesians to keep the unity points to that fact. Look at verse 3. Well, look at verse 2. He says that Christians, you need to lead, live with lowliness and gentleness and long-suffering bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavoring, I heard a pastor say one time, in fact, it was John DeBeau from the Foursquare Church. We got together, some pastors were praying, and, and he, somebody mentioned that verse, and he said, yeah, endeavoring. I like that word, endeavoring. It's a sweat word. <laughs> you gotta work at it. Unity doesn't come natural sometimes because we get so caught up with our own individual ideas. But we need to realize, however valid our own individual ideas are, they're not greater than God's ideas about the church. And so there's a lot of times that we need to step back, humble ourselves, and say, well, this is a valid idea, and that's a valid idea, and that's a valid idea, but we're not going to divide over those ideas. And so there's always been differences within the body of Christ. It's, it's, a, it's a natural thing. So we're going to backtrack. If you want to mark your spot, we're going to look in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 15. So if you turn over there with me uh, to the left a little bit, not too far, Acts chapter 15. Now, historically, the first Christians were of a Jewish background, and Judaism 
uh, one of the tenets of Judaism was the circumcision of baby boys at, at, at age uh, eight days. So on the eighth day, the, the parents would uh, go and the, the priest or the, uh, you know, yeah, the priest uh, would circumcise the baby boy. Interestingly enough, medically speaking, did you know that that's when blood begins to clot? I guess God kind of knows what he's doing. I mean, it's kind of bad enough anyway, you know? But thank God the blood clots. So, the, so that was a tenet of Judaism. So the first Christians uh, were, were Jewish. They had Jewish ethnicity, Jewish background, very schooled in the Old Testament, that kind of thing. And then non-Jews began to get saved and, and come to Christ as well and embrace Jesus as well. And so there was an argument in the church, should we make them adopt what we've been living for centuries? Shall we make them come through uh, the, 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 the filter, if you will, or not the filter, the, should we make them come through the door of Judaism to get to Jesus? And so there was a big disagreement in the church. What do we do with these people that have been living so differently? The Jews, by and large, were very religious people, very kept a kosher diet, obeyed the laws of God. The Gentiles living in Corinth and Rome, I mean, it was like, you know, getting saved out of Las Vegas or something, like anything goes, you know. What happens in Vegas was known all over the world. And so what do we do with these people? So there was a disagreement. So notice the disagreement here. Acts chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, 6 and 7. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren... They're coming to, to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the headquarters at this point of, of the Christian movement. Certain men came down from Judea and, and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised, you can, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So they're uh, forcing Judaism on these new Jewish people. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem, go to the headquarters of the church, to the apostles and elders about this question. Go down to verse uh, 6 and 7. So the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter, and when there had been much dispute, now notice we read in four verses there, we've read the word dispute twice. They debated, they argued. I mean, it was an important thing. What do we do with these new people coming to the church? But my only point is, is just this. There was dispute in the church. Now, at that point, there could have been a church split. But there wasn't. They worked it out. I love this. Verse 7, verse 6, excuse me. Uh, yes, 6 and 7. So the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to the men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe, so on and so forth. Uh, uh, where is it, 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 where is it? Looking down, 10, 10. Uh, sure, I can, 10 works. We'll go with 10. Now therefore, why do you put, test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples which were neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? They go on to basically work it out. That's my point. There was differences in the church, disputes in the church, intense disputes in the church, but they didn't split. They worked it out. Why am I saying this? Because if you become a part of any Christian church at all, there's people there. And people disagree. And they dispute and they argue and they debate and that, all of that. And then sometimes, even within a church just of this size, they'll say, well, I'm sitting over there and those people are sitting over there. And that's how we're, we go to the same church, but we really don't talk to each other because they think, blue and I think red, or they think red and I think blue, or they think that it's okay if a Christian does X, Y, Z, and I don't think so, so yeah, we're both Christians, but we're just not going to talk, and I just can't hang with them, and I don't understand them, and, and so on and so forth. Or you even kind of go so far as saying, I'm going to go to a church where, you know, they don't, they don't have people that, that speak red and do X, Y, Z, you know, and then you go to the other church, and then there's people there, too, and there's, they're thinking different things. And there's always going to be, well, what's my point? I'm glad you asked. There's always going to be disputes in the church. There's always going to be differences of opinion in the church. A church isn't united because everybody thinks the same thing. And we're going to get to that. But a church is united because we are one in Christ. And even in the early church, there were disputes. So if there's anybody here, perhaps you're new to church, or, you're, you know, uh, or maybe you've just forgotten somehow, if you want a church that's trouble-free, stay home. <laughs> watch us online, you know, and you, you can watch us online, and some people do that because they, 
I, I don't know that every, everybody, certainly not everybody that stays home and watches us online does it for the following reason, but probably some stay home and watch us online because they don't want to bother with people. People can be bothersome sometimes. Amen. <laughs> people can be a pain in the neck. You can just, God, what's wrong with that guy? It goes back to the first century. If you're looking for a church that's that's debate free, you're never going to find it. So if that illusion is somehow kind of hanging around in your mind, just get rid of it. That church does not exist. It'll exist in heaven beautifully, but it doesn't exist yet. But guys, sameness of opinion is not what unites us. May I say this? I think there are a lot of things that make people think or feel, I'm really part of that church. We all think the same thing. If there's a financial campaign, we're building a new building, you know, and so everybody's, we're all together, we're pulling as a team. Okay, I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing, but it's not the reason that we're gonna discover here or how God defines unity. A financial program isn't biblical unity, it's just a financial program. Does that make sense? We're going to do, we're going to, uh, we're going to go paint houses in Napa and suddenly everybody's together for a cause and I love coming to Cornerstone because we all come with painter's caps and after church we attack a house and we paint it and I've never felt so much a part of a team. We're all so unified. Well, uh, what happens when you disagree on the color? Or hey, I want the roller. <laughs> I don't want a brush, you know? Suddenly unity is gone. Things that we do, projects that we participate in, uh, goals that we have, a missions thing, a this or a that thing, or all those things can be good, but that's, those things are not the basis for, for unity. Jesus is the basis for unity. Not opinions, not projects, not goals, none of those things. Jesus is the basis for unity. Look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 2. Turn to the right in your Bible a little bit. Philippians chapter 4, verse 2. Uh, 2 and 3. The Apostle Paul is writing to a church, and he says, I implore Euodia, and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind about politics, no. About customs and preferences, no. About worship style, no. I implore them to be in the, of the same mind in the Lord. Now notice, this is a really crazy and wonderful verse. I love this. And I, I love this verse because it just shows you that, that Christians are humans and they make mistakes and they get attitudes and they have to change their attitudes and get corrected and all these things. They have to repent. Look at verse three. And I urge you also, true companion... So Paul is writing to somebody that he just calls true companion. Help these women who labored with me in the gospel with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Now what's happening here? Paul went on some missionary journeys and these two ladies went with him. Now imagine going on a missionary journey with Paul. That's like major league missions trip. You know, great preaching and probably some miracles and amazing the power of God and all these things. And, and these two ladies, Euodian and Tyche, I mean, they're there and they're serving and all of that. And then the missions trip's over and they go back to Philippi. And somehow after a time, you know, the excitement of the missions trip wears off and now they're fussing with each other. And these ladies were veteran Christians. These were probably not new believers don't know, but they certainly had an amazing experience going out into the world with the Apostle Paul. They were like, you know, really proven uh, to go through some stuff. And remember, Paul was persecuted a lot, suffered a lot. When you're traveling with Paul, you could be in danger. I mean, so there was a lot of commitment there. These gals were really, really committed to the cause. And then they go back home, and now they're fussing with each other. That's the church. Are we united because we don't fuss with each other? Nope. We're united because we're in Christ, right? You guys agree with that? If you don't agree with it, put them up. I'm right, I got the microphone, no. We're united because we are in Jesus. And I, all I'm trying to do is deconstruct the idea that church should never be, uh, should never have differences or debates or disagreements. That church doesn't exist. It's, it will never exist until we're with the Lord in glory. So, if that's a hope and a dream of yours, 
Uh, you can leave it at the door when you leave. <laughs> There's a big square, a uh, little you know, trash can there in the foyer. Just dump that idea off and just say, you know what, I'm going to make it work. I'm going to come back to this church or maybe I'll go over to Grace or Hillside or First Christian or some other church, and, but I'm going to make it work. God, lead me to a church, not where there's no disagreements, but God, lead me to a church where you want me, and I'm going to make it work. I'm going to learn how to get along with people. I'm going to learn how to humble myself. I'm going to learn how to take second or third or fourth place. I'm going to learn how to, to listen to other people's opinions. I'm going to learn to get off of my high horse. I'm going to learn to be a humble uh, person and realize that unity is not about having people think like me. Goodness sakes, that's what's happening to our country right now, isn't it? It's awful. I'll go on record. I hate it. It's hideous. It's disgusting. Some of the, the verbal warfare that's going on in the news networks and all this insanity. There's a higher calling than uh, Trump or Hillary. Aren't we all Americans? That kind of thing. We're all Americans. There's a, this country, this land is your land, this land is my, you know what I'm saying? Hey, what about that bigger thing? No, we're going to cut you off. And the, it's, it's, it's ugly, isn't it? That same spirit comes into the church. I hate hymns. I love hymns. I want rock. I hate rock. I mean, it's like, are you kidding me? Those things don't unite us. Jesus unites us. And that's what we have to learn. Look at your notes. I, I was re reacquainted with a, with a re really cool word. The church very well may be the most heterogeneous entity in the world. Everybody say heterogeneous. Hetero See, now you guys are getting smart today. This is education day, okay? Look at heterogeneous, composed of parts of different kinds having widely dissimilar elements. Even in this building, we have widely dissimilar elements. <laughs> I know because I read your Facebook pages. We have widely dissimilar elements, but somehow we all choose to gather together and say, that's the church family that I belong to. I'm surprised at some of the widely dissimilar elements that I discover about all y'all, okay? I am, and, but you know what? We're, we're one not because we agree on everything. We're one because we're in Christ, and he's led us to gather together. The church is not based on race, ethnicity, gender, social standing, political affiliation, educational compliments, or anything like that. We are one because we are one in Christ. If you want to think about it, and, and, and I stand by this uh, statement, the church very well may be one of the most heterogeneous entity in the world. Think about any uh, government, or think about any nation, or think about any movement, uh, or, you know, gathering of people that have a cause. I wonder uh, today, as the body of Christ gathered around the world, how many languages the Bible was read in, and how many cultures, and how many different styles of clothes. So I take just about anybody who wants to be my friend on Facebook, okay? There's a few exceptions, but I get this one church broadcast from India, and it's really interesting. I mean, the worship music, like, you know, the symbols, and you know, like, wow, you know? And I'm one with those people, not because I even, I don't even understand their language and the music doesn't move me. I'm one because we're one in Christ. The church is huge, and it's not based on, on ethnicity, language, political preferences, or anything. It is probably the most diverse entity in the entire world, if you think about it. Asian Pacific, uh, Alaska, Na Na Alaskan, uh, Native Americans in Alaska, Russians, uh, South America, the body of Christ down in South America, amazing group of people. I mean, yes, our love for tacos unites us, but it's bigger than that. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Think about it. Think how big the church is. And we're going to be gathered together before the throne of God. And it has nothing to do with anything earthly. It's all about Jesus. And that's how we need to see the church. So, unity, looking at your notes, is not something we accomplish, but it already exists. Unity already exists. Look at back, back to Ephesians uh, chapter 4, if you would. Ephesians chapter 4, you're close. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of, keep, uh, in the bond of peace. We don't have to create unity. We just have to maintain unity. We have to recognize it. Look at the word keep there in your notes, to attend to carefully, to take care of, and to guard. 
We want to guard the unity that we have. When a husband and wife become, become husband and wife, the Bible says the two become one flesh. Now in God's eyes, the two have become one, but then they drift apart or whatever. I don't feel close to her anymore. Or she doesn't feel close to me, whatever the case may be. The fact is, you're one. Well, it doesn't feel like it. Then you better rediscover that because you're one. You don't have to find things to become one about. You already are one. You need to rediscover that. You need to remember that. You need to know how God has defined you. You are one flesh. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, that kind of thing. We are one in marriage. So we don't re recreate something to make us feel one. We are reminded of the higher thing. Guys, if you're looking for ways to feel unified with other Christians in this room, you're aiming low. Can I say that? If you're looking for ways to feel like you're part of the body of Christ or feel connected to other people, you're aiming low. If you're looking for a mutual hobby, it's just a hobby. It's not bad necessarily, but it's just a hobby or political agreement or educational stimulation or whatever the case may be. None of those things are bad, but they're aiming low. You're one because Jesus lives in you and Jesus lives in them. You can't be any more one than that. How, how one is Jesus with you? He can't get any closer than live inside of you. Can you imagine that? He can't get any closer. You can't get any closer because he lives in that person too. We need to recognize that thing. We need to recognize that truth. We don't have to make anything happen here. It's already happening. He's already done it. We need to remember it. We need to recognize it. We need to practice it. Turn your page over. Jesus said in his priestly prayer in John 17 that they all may be one as, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. So unity is not based upon agreement over every issue. It's, it's, it's based on oneness. I'm not one with my wife because we agree on everything. We don't agree on everything. But we're one because we've come together in, in Jesus, we come together in marriage. Now, there's seven things here that we're going to look at in the time remaining. And um, if you have questions, obviously text them up. I'll try to, try to answer them for you. There's seven things that Paul writes about here um, that he says unite us. And so, um, multiple times the word one is used. And so, this is where I'm going to kind of challenge you a little bit. Look at your notes, just going to read. If you consider another Christian as not being a part of you, you are blinded. And that happens. How do I know that it happens? Because sometimes I make that mistake and I forget. Sometimes I, I, I relate to people more on soulish levels than on spiritual levels. And I have to, I have to break, break that in me all the time. I have to ask God to break that in me all the time. Jesus died for people of all races, cultures, habits, and temperament. Are you going to limit in your heart that which God does not limit? Differences, yes. Distinctions, yes. Divisions, no. Distinctions, fine. Differences, yes. Division, no. Now here's the things. Let's go down the list. He says we are one body. Organic oneness of the human body represents the church. The Apostle Paul uses the human body as a picture of, of, the, of the Christian body, of the church body. I have never, you know, I stub my toe or get an ingrown toenail or, you know, smash my thumb with a hammer, that kind of thing. I never look at my ingrown toenail and just say, you stupid toe, you know. It's like, I, I don't do that. It's like, oh, my toe, my toe, everybody, you know. Five, five foot radius, get away from me, you know. I never get mad at the parts of my body that are, that are not working well. If I get a migraine head, I kind of go, you stupid head, you know. I don't do that. My, I'm connected to my head. You know what I'm saying? You don't get angry at the parts of your body that, you know, that aren't working right or, or, or are disagreeable to how you feel because they're part of you. I really want you to think about that. The, the, let me just get really blunt. The people in this room that bug you, you're one with them, so get used to it. You're one with them. It makes just, it just makes, you know, let's say I, I kind of smash my thumb a little bit with, with the hammer and, you stupid thumb, I'm just going to cut you off, I'll get rid of you. Know, or you stupid hand, you're the one that didn't swing the hammer correctly, and you know what I'm saying? You don't do that with your, with your physical body, and yet that's the way that God describes the body of Christ. And how quick we are to eliminate another Christian because we disagree, or they did this to me, or, or said that, or gave me a, you know, a, a ugly face, or whatever the case is. 
Dear brothers and sisters, that's wrong. That's carnal. That's what the church at Corinth was. Paul said, when you do this and that, play favorites, are you not carnal? You're acting like a natural person without the Spirit of God. And so what's, what's my point on this one? We're going to move on. We just simply need to elevate our view of the, of the body of Christ, don't we? We need to elevate our view. Guys, I'll confess to you, and you could say the same thing to me, or if you got up here, you could say the same thing to all of us. There's Christians that I meet that I just go, oh my goodness, you are just weird and strange, and what, what are you saying, and why are you excited about that, and you're just strange to me, you know, and ah. Uh, okay, set that aside and remember, but Christ is in you, and Christ is in me, and get over it doesn't mean we're best friends or anything like that but it does mean I recognize in that person right there that on a soulish level I feel absolutely zero connection with none, none at all there are some people you meet there in the body of Christ and and they talk and you're just going hey you know I just just there's no there's no soulish I don't feel like we'd ever be friends or anything like that and, and the tendency can be therefore I'm moving away you not everybody exists to make you happy there's a concept. Maybe we could just say amen and close the church now. Not everybody exists to make you happy. I remember counseling a married couple one time that were not getting along, and the guy turned to me finally and points at her, isn't she here to make me happy? I just wanted to choke the guy. Are you kidding me? She exists to make you happy? The world revolves around you? That's how we get. But if we remember that we're one body, we just won't do that with each other. It might require, verse 3, endeavoring. We might have to work a little hard to recognize, I'm one with this person. I think differently, we vote differently, all those things, but we're one. I'm not going to dismiss them. He says, one spirit. It's the same Holy Spirit that drew us all to Christ. It's the same spirit that comforts, leads, guides, and teaches, energizes, and gives us gifts. When we fight with one another, we're fighting against the spirit. One thing that I love about um, our, our board of directors here at the church, uh, we sh uh, if you don't know those guys, we should introduce you to them at, at some point. They're good guys, but they're around. But when we vote on things, the church, you know, the church celebrated 25 years of, of existence in last October. You guys know that. In all the years that we've um, functioned as a board of directors, and by law, we're required by the IRS to have a board of directors to, ha to make financial decisions. It's not just me. There's seven or eight of us. I forget how many. That number changes. We've, we, we, have, we have agreed we will not pass any, you know, we will not approve anything unless there's a unanimous decision. 25 years, that's how, that's how we roll. If we don't all agree, then we're gonna, we're gonna table it and we'll get back to it next month because we recognize we can't start promoting like different ideas and stuff like that. And, and by God's grace, this church has never had a split. Have people left? Absolutely. Have people, some people left mad? Absolutely. But there's never been a split because churches fall apart from the top. And so I love these guys. Sometimes I'll have a good idea and they just kind of go, Bill, what are you saying? Oh, no, 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 we love you, man, but ah, you know. They vote me down. I'm okay with that because I recognize their safety in that. Or I, I might vote them down or we talk about it. And, but y there's unity there. And we recognize we need to protect it. And sometimes we can even be frustrated with one another. Why can't you see that this is a good idea or whatever the case may be? But we always strive for unity. Always unanimous decisions. Just want to let you guys know that. That's the kind of thing that we have to do. There's one body. There's one spirit. Look at uh, here. Just as you were called in the hope of your calling, we're all called to heaven. We're all called by the same God to serve the same kingdom of God and to exist in the realm of God in heaven. He says here, oh, oh <laughs> one thing that I missed, under number eight there. Let me just read it. All Christians share the same hope of heaven, the same promises of God, the same comfort of the Holy Spirit. Hoping for the same thing should bring us unity, especially heaven. Now I want you to consider this. When unbelievers hope for the same thing, it can cause division. There's a job promotion at work and there's only one promotion position and six people are hoping for it. They used to be friends, <laughs> but now they're all hoping for the same thing and it can cause division. Guys, there's enough heaven for all of us. 
I hope for heaven, you hope for heaven. I don't have to hope to get there sooner to make sure I get my place. There's enough heaven for all of us. It's a uniting thing. We share the same hope. I was able to share with Evie last night. I got to see her last night, beautiful time. Bent over, kissed her on the face. I said, you know, I, I don't think I've ever said this to anybody like this, Evie, but I'll see you on the other side. She goes, I know, I'll see ya. I didn't even say goodbye to her. I just said, I'll see you later. We have the same hope. There's enough heaven for all of us. We have one faith. We, care, we share a common faith. We agree on the person of Christ. There's one baptism. We're not baptized into a church or a denomination. We're baptized into Christ. We're placed into Jesus. That's what the word baptized means. There's one God and Father of all who is above all, through all, and in you all. Many times here, the Apostle Paul uses the word, the multiple uses of the word one. The same God we claim to love with our whole hearts, same commandments, same God that works in us, same God who is in us all. We have a spiritual and organic union with one another and with God. It is illogical, dear brothers and sisters, it is, is it, this is your spanking, everybody get ready. Here it comes, you ready? It is illogical and carnal to be rejecting one another. It doesn't even make sense. If you understand the truth about this, it doesn't even make sense that we reject each other. Disagree, absolutely. Distinctions, absolutely. Attend different churches, that's okay. Different emphasis, different focus, different giftings, different style, that's all okay. But to reject other Christians and, 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 and to forget all of this is carnal and natural and immature. And may I say this, knowing this should make us be more willing to endear our hearts to one another. Jesus said, if you, if you love one another, uh, uh, if you love people that are just like you, paraphrase, what, what better are you than, than robbers? Even robbers love one another <laughs> because they're, they, they're, they're based, they're, they're, their connection is based on what they do. Guys, our connection is based on who, whose we are. You with me? We are one in Christ. I pray that you'll be really prompted and really provoked to say, you know what, I have to do a lot better about not being so sensitive. I have to do a lot better about extending myself, sacrificing my time, going out of my way to help people. Christ in you, the hope of glory, guess what? Christ in them too. When you help them, you're blessing Jesus. That has nothing to do with politics or ethnicity or anything. We live above all that. Do you guys get that? We live all of, above all of that. Not because of who you are, because of who he is. We live above all that. One of my great prayers for this year is that we have an elevated view of what the church is. The church is not just somewhere where you can come and be a consumer, get the kind of music you like and the kind of preaching you like, and then go home and close your door and pull the shades. We, we, we need an elevated view of the church because the church is going to go on forever. And Trump isn't, and Hillary didn't, and yada, yada, yada. The governments of man are going to come to an end. Read Psalm 2. God sits in heaven and laughs. Not because he doesn't love them. He just says, oh, look what they're doing down there. He says like a, like a rod on a, on, a, on a clay pot, God will just come and break the governments of man. Our unity is based on the highest thing possible, the oneness we have in Jesus Christ. May I just say it? If you're a spiritual Christian, these truths ought to compel you to be self-sacrificing with your life towards other believers. And end of spanking, here I go, end of spanking. If you're unwilling to, you're disobedient and you're selfish. And you'll probably get sick of this church and go on to another one. And people jump ship on churches a lot of times just because they don't get their way. That's a shame, it's a shame because you'll never be satisfied. There's always those bothersome people wherever you go. Church, it would be great if it wasn't for the people. <laughs> it's a joke. Church would be great if it wasn't for the people. But here we are, in Christ in you, the hope of glory, and Christ in me, the hope of glory. Questions to consider. Unbiblical views. Do you feel closer to your unsaved friends than you do with Christians? Now, I wrote this because sometimes I feel that way. And I'm being honest with you, okay? And let me unpack this a little bit. Spiritually, you and I are linked to believers in deeper ways than to unbelievers. That's the truth. We are linked to Christians in a deeper way than I'm linked to people that don't know Jesus. I may feel closer to them, 
but I'm not one with them, I'm one with other Christians. Let me, let me work this out. On a social, emotional, intellectual level, you may find, we may find that we prefer unbelievers for our friends, yet we are spiritually not one with them. Perhaps we enjoy oneness with unsafe friends because we relate to people on a soulish level instead of on a higher level of spiritual truth. There are unsafe people in Napa that I really like hanging around. They're funny. They're tolerant of my opinions. They're intellectual. They like to read. Same sense of humor. I experience that with them. And on those levels, with some Christians, I don't experience those kinds of things. They're intolerant of me. They disagree. They're opinionated. They don't stop to listen to me. They just want somebody to listen to them, etc., etc. So if I just go on a soulish level, I can gravitate to people that are just like me. Birds of a feather flock together, okay? But I have to realize, and it's not wrong to be friends with, with uh, people that don't know Jesus. We should be friends with people that don't know Jesus. But in doing so, I can look back at this Christian and go, eh. I'm going to spend heaven with ah. Eh. <laughs> I'm going to spend eternity with ah eh, over here. And I need to remember, I'm really stimulated by this person's uh, passion for music and their humor and all these kinds of things, but boy, I, I, let, I better not dismiss this Christian over here because I'm one with them. Is, you guys get that? It's real easy to become soulish, guys. Real natural thinking, real carnal in, in who we like to hang out with and who we're quick to dismiss. And if you're dismissing Christians because they don't satisfy you, that's what we put our kids in time out about. They didn't get their way. We can't be those kinds of people. We need to realize the body of Christ, we're one in Jesus. Biblical view. Last down at the bottom, if you have any questions, fire them in. We need to realize that we are one with every Christian because of our mutual faith and our placement in Jesus. We need to determine to not relate just on an elemental natural level with people we need to live above that recognize and seek the greater spiritual unity in christ and keep it and fight hard to keep it what do we tell married couples that aren't getting along work it out work it out it's the better thing to do fred you are one with susie susie you're one with fred yeah but he yeah but she i'm sorry work it out you said yes. When I said yes to Christ, when Jerry Dorman, when Vince, when Patty, when all these people, when we said yes to Christ, we also, maybe you weren't thinking about it, said yes to one another. We're one in Jesus. Questions? What do they preach about at Unitarian churches? I don't know. I imagine some, some, something about unity. I, I honestly don't know, and I'm trying to be facetious. I don't know. I'm sure that's easily discovered on Google, so I would encourage you to, to maybe look that up. I know that one in Christ means believing that we are saved by grace, not what we do, but what Christ did on the cross. Yes. God says in his word, he knew us before the foundation of the earth and formed us in the womb. He also said that he made man and women to procreate. Yes. How can Christians be one in Christ and still believe it's okay to have abortions and embrace homosexuality? Isn't this like the emergent church belief, anything goes? Well, I'm not going to address the, the idea of the emergent church uh, because that, that definition of a church movement uh, seems to be uh, morphing and changing. And um, I asked one pastor one time, Bill Holdridge, as a matter of fact, I said, what does the, the emergent church believe? And he says, I don't know. He said, it's like nailing jello to the wall. <laughs> I don't know what they believe. But... <laughs> I thought that was funny. But I will respond to this. How can Christians be in Christ, believe abortions are, are okay, and have, embrace homosexuality? We have, to, we, we have to accept what God has told us. And we can all have ideas, and I can have ideas, and sometimes I do, that are contrary to the word of God. I have, I, you know what? I could, I could be the old me of two or three things lined up that were bad and, and I kind of didn't handle it well. I could be the old me. I'm not trying to, don't go talk about me today, okay? Or start a prayer chain, okay? I'm just saying, under the right circumstances, I could be the old me pretty quick. The grace of God would keep me. God would break my legs, I think, and stop me. But I still have it in me. 
I'm, st- I'm, I'm a redeemed spirit in an unredeemed body, and the unredeemed body likes to do wrong things, okay? But I have Jesus. He, he's the greater passion of my life, so I push down the other passions. To answer that question, uh, I think it's a misunderstanding of the word of God. It, it may be a lack of un- understanding, or it may be simply an emotional rejection of what God has said for selfish or sentimental reasons. Why do I think it's okay to not forgive somebody? I know Jesus said to forgive 70 times 7. I know that. Except for that guy, <laughs> right? Why do, why do I nurse, nurse a grudge ever? Because I can be carnal. I'm saved, but I can, be, I can act ungodly at times. So can you, by the way. If you didn't know, so can you. And so I would never want to say that somebody's not a Christian because they're on the fence or maybe leaning pro-abortion and pro-homosexuality, but I would sit down with them lovingly and open the Bible and say, can I share my thoughts with you? And take them to the Word of God. And then let the Holy Spirit work on their minds and their hearts. And if they are a Christian and they're leaning in the wrong direction, they're not to be dismissed either. Do, some, do Christians sometimes think the wrong things? Uh, Yeah. <laughs> Should we dismiss them? Because we are what in Christ? One. So that truth promotes long-suffering with one another. You don't dismiss somebody because they're, you don't dismiss somebody because they're biblically wrong about something. Another question. Do Christians consider Catholics as saved? Real big. <laughs> I guess we're scratching a few itches today, aren't we? <laughs> I grew up Catholic. Uh, my family, we went to Catholic church. I was an altar boy, by the way. Um, I disagree with some of the doctrine of the Catholic church. I don't think it's correct. I think there are people in the Catholic church that know Jesus and are on their way to heaven. Absolutely. I, I, I think the Catholic church has added some things that are unbiblical and things, there are things that muddy the water. I think if taken too far, it could lead somebody astray from God. But I also think the same thing is true about some Protestant churches too. That's why we want to read and understand God's word. So if somebody's a Catholic, don't write them off as being impossible to be saved because there's true believers in the Catholic church. I do believe that. Finally, do you know Jesus today? Are you, par- are you part of his family Are you part of the church? We say yes to God. We ask him to forgive us. We admit that we've done wrong. We admit that we can never uh, cleanse ourselves or, or pay the debt that we owe to God. And we simply say yes to him. And that's how you become a Christian. Let's, uh, let's end with a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for your grace, your love, your mercy. Thank you for this, this thing called church. It's, it's a tremendous entity it spans millennia and race and language and culture and it's massive and it's huge and it's everlasting and lord i pray that we would have an an exalted view of the church universal and also of cornerstone and i pray that we would have an, an exalted view of the churches in town that bear your name and that we would appreciate them more and love them more and support them more And Lord, I pray that you'd teach us how to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit, Lord. The the unity that you created, may we fight hard to protect it and promote it, Lord. Pray your blessings on each one here. If there's anyone here, Lord, that has never said yes to you, may they say yes to you today. Thank you, Lord.